Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. A lot of good things have been happening, but one thing I want you to understand is that there are two plans for your life. God has a plan for your life. And we've said this a thousand times, but the devil has a plan for your life too. And I think it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure out that God's plan for you is better than the devil's plan. Because the devil's plan is stealing, killing, and destroying. And God's plan is life abundantly. I have some things I wrote down that I wanted to say to you. I even dropped them off by the video department, some notes with some scriptures. But I really feel that we are to go to, through a passage right now. And we're going to look at what the Word of God has to say about a situation it's a situation that if you've ever been in a church, grown up in a church, been to very many Bible studies, you know this story. But we're going to take a look at this story and dig down just a little deeper than what's normally dug. All right? So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, and let's take a look starting at verse 21. It says, now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side. Now the boat that he was on, we've been in Israel, you've been in Israel, several of you. Uh, you know the kind of boat that Jesus was on. It was not just a, a little boat. It was, it was a boat that would handle 40, 50, maybe even 100 people. Uh, they were fishing boats, boats that would handle a lot of fish. And the Galilee has always been known for the number of fish that it's had. In fact, uh, at the time of Jesus, there were 153 varieties of fish in, in the Galilee. But Jesus went over again to the other side by boat. A great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Now, when we say a great multitude, we're not talking 15 or 20 people. Usually in the Greek, when it talks about multitudes, it's talking about at least, at the very minimum, in the thousands so there there could have been as few as a thousand or two there could have been as many as 10 or 20 thousand you know it wasn't uncommon for Jesus to be in a place remember at one time he fed 4,000 another place he's fed 5,000 but also keep in mind it wasn't 5,000 people it was 5,000 men and the 5,000 men had 5,000 wives with them and back in that day, they didn't have birth control. And they didn't just have 1.2 kids. They, they, all, all the families had a lot of kids. So when Jesus fed the 5,000, he, he may have been feeding 20, 25, 30,000 people. What, not just 5,000. So when he got off the boat, there was a great multitude there. Look at verse 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, when he saw Jesus, here's what the ruler of the synagogue did. He fell down at the feet of Jesus. Okay, first of all, what's that do? That, that tells you something. That tells you that he had great honor for Jesus. Even though he was a ruler in the synagogue, he had so much respect for Jesus that he fell down at his feet. That's only the kind of thing you do for a ruler. And he himself was a ruler. So he was acknowledging that Jesus was a ruler of rulers. And look at verse 23. And begged him earnestly, saying. This kind of caught my eye when I was reading this, in that in our circles, under the New Covenant, we as faith people, we teach that if you beg Jesus, we're not beggars. We don't have to beg him. And that is true. We are to go before the throne of grace boldly. We are to proclaim um, our righteousness and our belief in him and ask with confidence. This is the confidence that we have. 
However, we, we need to understand that under the new covenant, the covenant we're under, and the old covenant, the covenant we're not under, there are principles that are the same. And I've heard many New Testament Christians, of course, that's all the kind that there is. There isn't such a thing as an Old Testament Christian. So, you know, us as New Testament believers, let's put it that way, um, we need to understand that God hasn't changed. That the, the, principle, the principles he set up under the Old Covenant, many of these are principles that are spiritual principles that have nothing to do with the covenants. Now, What's that have to do with what I just said here? Well, this ruler was begging Jesus. Now, we know that the new covenant's better than the old covenant. So if you could get something done under the old covenant, technically you should be able to get it done easier by grace under the new covenant. It, it showed me something, and we'll see it later. It did not disqualify him for receiving from God because he was desperate and he was begging. Now, I do not suggest that you act desperate and beg God because we should go with confidence. But when you see someone who is desperate, who may not be as deep in faith as you are, and you see them praying incorrectly, or you see them begging God when we know that we're children of the king, we don't, we don't have to go before the throne as beggars, don't count them out. Don't start saying things like, well, they'll never get their prayer answered. They just don't have faith because they're begging. No. Follow me through on this. You're going to find out that he got his prayer answered. He got his request taken care of under the old covenant, and he, he was begging. He was, he was desperate. And he begged him earnestly, and here's what he said. My little daughter lies at the point of death come and lay your hands on her now what is, what was he doing here now think about this he was telling jesus what to do now sometimes we do that we say here's how i want you to do it here's what i want done here's how it's going to happen i'm going to take them to this healing service and i'm going to walk forward with them and the evangelist is going to lay his hands on them. And Father, when he lays his hands on them, I proclaim that you're going to heal them right at that moment. Well, he didn't get rebuked by Jesus because of what he said. But you'll see here in a little bit, Jesus, regardless of what he said, he did it his own way. But he told him, he said, Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. In other words, he was saying, if you lay your hands on her, and back then, if you study it out, the priest laid hands on people. The rabbis laid hands on people. There was a laying on of hands similar to what we do. It was a laying on of hands, and it was done a certain way. The hands of the one in authority went on to the head of the one who was receiving the anointing or the blessing or, or whatever. Follow me on this. Verse 24. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude, what are we talking about? Thousands of people, followed him and thronged him. You look up that word thronged in the dictionary, and you're going to find, it's a word we don't use very much. I, I was not talking on the phone today and and. I did not tell someone I have been thronged with work. You know, we don't use that word too much. But that just basically means that pressed in, multiplied pressures, and uh, a lot of people affecting what it is you're trying to do. So there was a crowd. They followed him, and they thronged him. They didn't just sit and follow from back there. They encircled him, pressed in. And now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had a, a female problem, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that uh, any of the doctors had been able to heal. 
Now, just imagine you. What if you had had a problem for 12 years? Think back 12 years. Think how long 12 years is. And, and you have been suffering with this problem for 12 years. Now, for a woman to have an issue of blood for 12 years was probably one of the worst things that could happen to her. And there are several reasons for that. First of all, when a woman was going through her time of womanhood each month, she was separated from the people. And men could not, you could not touch a woman. Any woman. Or let's put it another way. The women could not touch a man. Any man during that time. And the law was, keep in mind, they were living under the law. The law was that they could be executed. I mean, it was severe. So for 12 years, just think about this, for 12 years she had had very little social contact of any kind. But look what it says. And a certain a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, and look at verse 26, and had suffered many things. Who from? The physicians. How many of you have suffered many things? From the physician you know as great as our medical science is now it's only been in the last hundred years that we've had the what we call the modern miracle of medicine and even as great as is as it is it's still antiquated we, we still there's things going on in people's bodies we still don't know how to heal we still don't know how to fix but a hundred years ago, oh my goodness, did you know one of our presidents, one of our presidents died because he was not feeling well, and the doctor came in, and in order to purify his body, they injected his veins with mercury. One of the presidents of the United States. It's one of the things you don't read about in school too much. But... We really just kind of like killed one of our presidents by injecting him with mercury. Well, why would they do something that stupid? Because just 100 or 200 years ago, they didn't think it was stupid. They thought it was how to heal. Now, take that back 2,000 years. And the doctors at the time of Jesus, think how antiquated things were then. I mean, their home remedies were... They may have known a few things, but look what happened here. It says, and she suffered many things from, the, from many physicians. What does that mean? She didn't just go to one doctor. She went from doctor to doctor to doctor. And look, look at this. Now, here's, now think about this. She suffered physically, but she also had another problem. And here's what it is. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but grew worse. So here's this woman. Look at this scripture. She spent all that she had. So now she's broke. She can't go to the doctor anymore. You can't go to the doctor if you don't pay. And it says right here that the doctors were charging her. She spent all she had on the doctor. And instead of getting better, every time she went, she got worse. Now, I'm sure they weren't injecting her with mercury. But whatever they were doing, it was not helping. And now, not only is she, the, after 12 years, the sickest she has ever been in her life, she is also now the brokest. She is the poorest she's ever been her, in her life. So what is it that the Bible promises us? Health and prosperity. What is it she's completely lost? Health and prosperity. Now let's take a look at uh, verse 27. When she heard about Jesus. Now, what I want to talk to you about is your faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Once again, I know you know this, but faith comes by hearing. So you're going to hear it again. There's only one verse in the New Testament that talks about how you can get faith. One verse. 
Only one verse says how faith comes. Faith is believing God. How are you going to develop your belief in God? How are you going to, to know that you know that you know what God promised is real? How are you going to have that type of deep faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing. Hearing what? By the word of God. So when she had heard about Jesus, so somebody was talking. Now see, this miracle would not have happened had not somebody been talking. Because you can't hear if nothing's spoken. If I walked up here tonight and I just looked at you, and you looked back at me, and then you left. And somebody would say, well, what did you hear? You say, I didn't hear anything. He didn't speak. This woman heard about Jesus. So somebody was given their testimony. Don't you ever think that what's happened to you and you tell somebody about how God delivered you is, is not good? When you tell them how by the word of God he delivered you, what you're doing is you're doing the same thing that the friends who didn't get credit, by the way, the friends who didn't get credit to talk to this woman. Somebody talked to her and told her about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Okay, now first of all, let's just say this. The very fact that probably most of the inner circle and the people around Jesus who were pressing in were men, probably. Can't guarantee it. There may have been some women, I'm sure there were. But probably his disciples and his security team, which was his disciples, they were in closest. And actually we know they were because they, as soon as this happens, you'll see in just a moment, they spoke to him. And in order for them to speak to them, they had to be in close proximity. Well, how, how could she get in to touch Jesus? She had to press through the crowd. And every man she pressed past and touched was a death sentence. And legally, they could have, if there would have been somebody there that wanted to enforce the law, they could have stoned that woman right on the spot just because she pressed through the crowd. But what does faith do? Faith and fear are opposites. And I, I like to think of it as like a, a, a teeter-totter. Does anybody remember what a teeter-totter is on a, plat on a playground? Okay, you do, huh? So uh, when one side goes down, the other side goes up. Maybe we should say this, the scales of justice. But when, when the teeter-totter goes down on one side, I'm sure the people watching in Australia are thinking, what in the world is he talking about? I don't know what they call a teeter-totter in Australia. Uh, but let's just put it this way. If you have a flat board on a, on a centerpiece and you push down on this side, this side comes up. And you push down on this side and this side comes up. That's the way faith and fear are. As your faith increases, the fear decreases. As the fear increases, the faith decreases. You cannot have them both up at the same time. And this woman was full of faith because she had heard about Jesus and she was encouraged. And as she had the faith to press through that crowd, there's, she had no fear. Now, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Well, that was the little tassel on his prayer shawl. Yes. Now, Why? Why did she do that? Why? Because it said there that she'd heard about Jesus. And we could go back into the book of Mark and we could read several places where it says that when Jesus would go to a town, they would take the sick people out and lay them beside the street. And as Jesus walked by, it tells us this in the Bible, as Jesus walked by, and they touched him, they were healed. So she must have heard about this. She heard about Jesus, and she heard that if you can just somehow touch him, you can be healed, because that's the way it works. And that's where she had focused her faith. And it says here, 
For she said, now, now look at what she said. Let's take a look at verse 28. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. That was her confession. That was where she had focused her faith. That's where she had decided her healing was. Her healing was focused in the belief that she had heard everyone who had touched him was healed. She believed that everyone who touched him was healed. She said, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. And she snuck through the crowd and touched him. And in verse 29, it says, immediately Jesus healed her. It says, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Do you see that? I like that word, immediately. Because I know that healing takes time. Usually healing takes time. But with God, he is a miracle God. And what his desire is, is to flow out all the gifts of the Spirit and all of his power at once. And he doesn't, his desire is not for us to just be healed. His desire is for us to be miraculously healed. That's a little difficult for some people to believe, and that's difficult for some people to put their faith there. Now, that's where she had her faith. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. That's it. That's what she believed. Now, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, how, how did he know that? I mean, how did Jesus know that power had gone out of him? Now, I've been in the ministry over 50 years, and I can tell you, there are times when I lay hands on someone, I know something happened. There are times I can feel it through my body. There are times I lay hands on them, and they feel like they're about to pass out. They don't realize it, but so am I. You know Many times. I'm not saying you have to feel anything. There have been many times people have been healed. I have felt nothing. But I do know that Jesus experienced something physical in his body. And he said, well, no, wait a minute. He was God. Now, he came to this earth as the Son of Man. He operated in the anointing as the Son of Man. He never performed a miracle on this earth until after the Holy Spirit came upon him in the River Jordan when he was baptized by John. So the reality is, is he was operating under the same anointing that Steve operates under. The anointing of the Holy Spirit from God poured out through us. See, Jesus was showing us what can happen in our lives. I honestly believe that if you're walking in the anointing, somebody can focus their faith to the point of saying, if I can just touch his car, if I can, if I can just touch his car, and they follow you down to Walmart, wait till you go inside, and they walk over and, and fall on the hood of your car. You say, that sounds silly. Well, how much sillier is this? A woman thinking if she can just sneak up from behind and touch the edge of Jesus' clothes, she gets healed. And that's pretty silly if you really think about it. Because what's his clothes got to do with anything? Well, he was wearing them. Well, Steve was driving the car. You know, look, it's about your faith. It's not about the things. It's about your faith. And Jesus um, immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd, and he went, oh, thank you, Jesus. No, he didn't put on a show. 
You know, when I was reading this, it just today, it just seemed like so many things were flowing. Jesus wasn't trying to be a big deal. Now, there are people who, as they minister, do it in an emotional way, and I'm not against that. Okay, do you understand that? I am not against that in any way. But what I want you to know is you don't have to be emotional in order for the power of God to flow. It can be a natural thing that you do that happens in your body, and, and it's okay if you get the charismatic grip and the Holy Spirit shakes and, and all that. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. I like it, actually. It makes it all kind of like more fun. But it doesn't have to be there. And Jesus, knowing that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and he said, Hey, who touched my clothes? He knew. He could tell somebody had touched his clothes. He wanted to know, Who touched my clothes? Now, <laughs> here's his security, Phil. Listen to this. But his disciples said to him, his security guards said to him, Hello? <laughs> Don't you see this multitude thronging you? Hello? What do you mean who's pressing in? Everybody's pressing in. But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Verse 33. But the woman, now all of a sudden, everything's focused on her. I mean, she got healed, and now there's no hiding. Fearing and trembling, and why would she? Because there's a good possibility. That's when the reality hit. Oh, my goodness. They know I've had this flow of blood for 12 years. I've been sequestered for 12 years, and now here I am, and they've all seen me press through the crowd. He said, knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I love testimonies. I do love testimonies. Don't anybody take this wrong. But when somebody gets healed, they want to they tell you the whole story. Right? And some of you have told me the whole story. And I tell you, when I get healed, I tell you the whole story. There's just something about, you just want to tell it. Now you think Jesus didn't know? Well, she told him anyway. It doesn't say she told him some of the truth. She told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, because you touched my garment and because you've been giving at the synagogue and because you walked 19 miles in the rain to get here. No, he didn't, he didn't start giving her all that. He just said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, I think we forget that sometimes. It's our faith. Now, let's don't get critical, any of us, about ourselves. And that's who we beat up on the most, is we beat up on ourselves. I... Uh, I want to tell on myself right now. Is it okay to tell on me? Um, I had red spots on my face. How many of you have noticed them? Now, it, it didn't matter too much when we just had analog TV. But when we went to high definition, what do they call it, 4G, whatever, when we went to the, to the 1080 high definition where you can you can see the little hairs on the back of a gnat crawling on the edge of the pulpit. When they went, you could see these little red spots on my face. And so before I would come out to the platform, uh, I would be given some little makeup stuff to put on the little dots so that they wouldn't show up so much because I literally had people sending me emails saying, Pastor, are you okay? We, we see that rash on your face. Well, and they send that to me on the Sunday that I taught about healing. So, 
Oh. I was believing God that it would go away. And I, lay, I laid hands. I literally laid, laid hands on myself. I, I spoke over it. Loretta has spoken over it. Uh, the prayer team has spoken over it. It's, it's some kind of a rash. It was not really bothering me. It just, in the cameras, every now, these little red spots would kind of look weird. And I'm getting fed up with having to put on makeup. I'm not a girl. I don't want to wear makeup of any kind, you know. I'm a man. Men don't wear makeup, even for cameras. If you got a weird face, just have a weird face. Men don't need makeup, okay? So, you, sh you guys, that was your place where you're supposed to say, you don't have a weird face, Pastor. So, I was praying about it, and I just really felt of the Lord, and, and some of the people who had been praying even said the same thing. Why don't you just go to the doctor? Why don't you just go to the doctor? Well, I've been traveling. You know, like last month, last month, I went to five different conferences, and they all weren't in the United States. And in 35 days, I was at five different conferences, and no two of them were even in the same state. And it just was a lot going on, and I just didn't really have time. So I just took my little makeup thing with me, you know, and before we would do a television thing or whatever, I'd, you know, I'd hit those little spots, and it would kind of somewhat cover them, whatever. And then I find out, you know, somebody comes up to me and says, you didn't do it right. And so I don't know. Did you put the under thing on before you? I don't know anything about underground work, foundation stuff. I just, all I know is it's powder, stick it on the spot, you know, and we're done. They say, well, now you just got a big spot of powder. I don't care. At least you can't see the red spot. Well, that looks worse. You know, so I just getting tired of all this. So today, I went to the doctor. And the doctor says, it's no big deal. He says, I, I can give you something here and it'll take care of it. But he says, it'll take about two weeks for it to clear up. Well, we're doing a couple of television programs uh, that will be aired on TBN this Wednesday. And I, was, I said, so it won't be done by Wednesday? He said, I said two weeks. Well, I'm thinking to myself, I'm a man of faith and I teach faith and I teach healing and I've laid hands on people and they've been healed and I've been healed why can't I get rid of this within two weeks and here's the answer I don't know all I know is I was obedient to what God told me to do and now that you all know my secret in a couple of weeks, every time I walk on the platform, you're all going to be saying, does he have that red spot on his face? <laughs> I don't care what you think. <laughs> if they all go away, I may take Loretta's little mascara pencil and just put a couple on there just to make you feel funny. But, <laughs> but the real, and this was not a life-threatening thing. This was just strictly a cosmetic look thing, okay? But bottom line is, He's going to give me the medicine, or he gave me the medicine. I take the medicine, and healing is a process. It takes, it takes a little time. You cut your finger, it takes a while for it to heal. Even though it starts healing the moment you put the Band-Aid on it and pull the skin back together, <laughs> you know, it starts healing at that moment. It takes a while for it to be completely healed. Why is that? Well, that's just that's the nature of healing. But I think God wants us to go beyond that. He wants, us, he wants us to go into miracle healing. And I just wanted you all to know that, that I'm human just like you. I mean, I, I'm not an angel. You, that's Loretta. I'm not an angel. Um, never been an angel. I'm not going to be an angel. I am not a... a, a but I am a messenger. Yes, okay. Got the Greek, got the Greek scholar over here. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at this. But do you do understand this? I, I had a tendency at first, when I was in the doctor's office earlier today, and he said, well, this will take a couple of weeks. I had a tendency at first to, to beat on myself because I'm the guy who teaches healing. And I knew I was going to talk about healing tonight. But see, I think it's better for us to be honest and not try to be phony 
And we can learn through other people's journeys. Right? Okay. Let's take a look at this. Quit looking at my spots. Okay. As soon as Jesus heard... Wait, no, wait. I'm at the wrong place here. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith, in other words, your belief has made you well. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. He proclaimed the healing of the affliction after it was actually already, already manifest. He never actually, he proclaimed be healed, but when he said be healed, her faith had already healed her. Now, faith, I'm, I'm going to, this is going to be real early tonight. I have other things I would like to teach you. And I've probably got 15 or 20 minutes that I normally use. But what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to, Ron doesn't believe me. <laughs> He's over there. He's heard this before. In conclusion and two hours later. No, but I want to leave you with this thought tonight. And I don't want to, excuse me, but I don't want to mess it up with my other stuff I'm going to say. I want to leave you with this. Faith has four basic components. All right? Faith has four basic components. And this woman, it explains it clearly here, she did all four of them. And when she did all four of them, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. I'm going to tell you what those four are right now. Number one, she heard the word. You've got to hear the word. I'm not talking about stories. Testimonies are good, but you've got to have the word in the testimony. It's okay for somebody to give you a testimony, but it will only build your faith if they give you scripture in it. She heard the word. You have to hear the word. The next thing is, it says, and she believed it. That's what it says. She believed it. So you hear the word, and then you believe it. That's number two. See, Ron, I'm moving right along. Number two is believe the word. Now, believing is a decision. Believing is a decision you make in your mind. You decide what to believe. You decide you're going to go that way before you go that way. You decide you're going to buy that car before you buy that car. Your Look, belief is a decision. You have to say, I believe. Let let's even make it clear. Uh, let's say Bill and Nancy. Um, there's a point in time when Bill says to Nancy, now this may not be exactly the way it worked, okay, but Bill said to Nancy, Will you marry me? Nancy is thinking to herself, I don't know. So she goes to her girlfriends and she says, Bill has asked me to marry him. What should I do? And her girlfriends say to her, do you love him? And she goes, I don't know. I don't know. Well, why don't you know? Well, I, said, I don't know. He, he, he does this and he does this and he does this. Yeah, I guess I do. I love him. See, she, you have to come to a point of, of a decision. Yes, I love him. Okay, now what are you going to do about it? I'm going to say yes. You, know, you, you have to make a decision. Now, you make that decision in your head. It may get down into your heart at a later time, even after a few years of living together. But the decision to love, the decision to believe, when you have a presidential election, you hear all the facts, and somebody says, well, what do you believe? Who, who, who do you believe in? Are you going to vote for this party, or are you going to vote for this party? And you calculate everything, and then you make a decision on what you believe. And once you make that decision, then you go with that one. Well, here's the thing. She heard the word. She heard that if she would touch the hem of his garment, or if she would touch him, she would be healed. And, and she decided to believe it. And then the third thing is you got to speak it. Remember, she, it says, and she said, you get that? And she said, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. So she heard about him. 
She believed what she heard, and she spoke it. And then the fourth thing is you've got to act on the word. So the last thing is, then she had to, not only did she hear it, believe it, and say it, but then she put it into action. The faith without works is dead. She pressed through the crowd at all costs and touched the hem of his robe. And when she completed those four things, when she heard, believed, spoke, and acted on it, Jesus said, woman, your faith has made you well. You learn anything tonight? God bless you all. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your word is true. I speak the blessing upon these, your people. I call those who are sick healed. I call those who are tormented healed. I call those who are oppressed free. I curse any demonic spirit attacking them. I call them whole and complete in the name of Jesus. I call them protected by the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim it. Amen. God bless you all.